Hello there, YouTube! Devin here again. Uh, incredibly sorry for not making any uh, YouTube videos as of recent. Uh, I've been getting over with a pretty terrible cold, and I have started a new job. This new job is actually going quite fantastic, though. Um, this here is a cool video um, that I know you guys probably have never thought of or really heard of before, because it's not covered that much. But it's also a, a fact that is often overlooked, and we'll we'll get into how the uh, the natures and everything like this, because it's actually really kind of a disappointment. And I know a lot of you uh, people out there, Canadian fangirls, much like myself. So, but this is going to be a video on some extras to the Ross rifle. Now, the Ross rifle uh, is probably one of the most infamous stories in Canadian military history. They are not. It was not a very good rifle, honestly. So, for what it was meant to do, uh, military-wise, civilian-wise, fantastic rifle. One of the best in the world, actually. It was a great target rifle, a great hunting rifle. Uh, it worked fantastically well if you had good ammo and you cleaned it relati uh, relatively regularly and everything like that. Uh, but as a military rifle, it was quite awful. And we're going to get into the bayonet for the Ross rifle because the bayonet was also known to be quite terrible and <laughs> needed to be changed and has a cool story of its own. So uh, what we're going to start off here with is this is the model 1905 bayonet. So uh, so this is for the Ross Mark II, um, otherwise known as the model 1905. And this one, as you can see, was... Uh, it's really nice wood. You can see the cartouche in it still. And here is when it was made. It was made in 810. Uh, so, um, would have been made in, that would be September of 1910. Um, this is for the 1905, which had a much smaller uh, diameter barrel. And it's been proof marked and everything. It's in excellent, excellent condition. You can see the very nice stamp in this one Ross rifle. Uh, company Quebec. Uh, this is patented 1907. So this is the 1907 pattern bayonet, which would be the last pattern of bayonet for uh, the Ross rifle. So, and you see a lot of these get cut down later into fighting knives during uh, World War II and everything like that. Now, this rifle uh, bayonet uh, was not well liked because uh, if you haven't noticed, um, the shape of it. Now, the bayonet is designed for one thing. It's for stabbing. Uh, this bayonet is known for being particularly bad at stabbing <laughs> because it's round, often referred to as the butter knife because of its shape, and that's what it looks like. It's very butter knife-esque. It's not even really all that sharp. As you can see, I'm, I'm forcefully kind of pushing my hand into this point, and it's not, not all that sharp. It could be sharpened, but the thing is, the shape was meant to be like this for some reason, and even into 19, uh, even into the 1907 bayonet, uh, for the 1910, which I'll show you here in a second, started out as this round shape, this butter knife shape. So, they are made out of quite good steel, though, actually, and they do take an edge very, very well. The Canadians made very, very awesome steel, actually, pretty world-renowned steel, and they still do, uh, to a degree, um, but most famously from basically the late 1800s and then through World War II, they made some very fantastic steel. So this is actually a very, very high quality steel. I'm not sure what the exact composition of it is, but it's a very, very good steel and it takes an edge very, very well. This one though, I've left the, uh, basically it's the training edge on it. It's not sharp at all. Just to show you guys, so as you can see, your watch push. I'll push the knife blade in pretty hard, and move it back and forth, and nothing. So it's just uh, basically a dull training edge. And the reason I don't sharpen my bayonets, uh, for one, it's um, <clears throat> uh, when I go out and uh, take these out and stuff for like display. There's no reason for it to be really sharp. Uh, for two, I like to keep them in kind of original condition as I get them. And for three, uh, I have a lot of pretty idiot friends, and if they were drinking and they grabbed this and they cut themselves, which they honestly deserve to do if they're being that stupid, um, but this keeps that from happening by not putting an edge on it, so, um, but it's, it's just another one of the fail stories of the Ross rifle. 
So, and now we'll get into the 1910 bayonet, which is, this is the same thing, it's still a model uh, 1907 bayonet. This one was not stamped as nice as you could see, so, but it's the same exact stamp. Ross Rifle Company patented 1907, so, and this one has a bunch of uh, different stamps on it as well. I don't remember where this one is, is dated. So, but this one uh, has the nice stamps on it too. The wood is not in nice a condition as this one. This one has a lot of its original blue on it though. Uh, so a lot of the 1907 bayonets were blued like this. And as you can see, this one has been modified. Now it originally would have had the same exact shape as the 1905 bayonet right there. It would have been this round butter knife shape. But when war broke out, they quickly realized that that shape was not good for stabbing because it was too round. It didn't achieve the penetration they wanted, especially through winter gear, um, field equipment, you know, just tons of other stuff. It didn't achieve the penetration that they wanted. So a lot of these bayonets, which is, this is another terrible, terrible story having to do with the Ross rifle bayonet. So a lot of these bayonets were sent to England, okay, to be sharpened because the Canadians did not have the facilities or the manpower at the time to modify these bayonets. So they shipped a ton of them over to, over to England, looking like this, where the British changed the shape to this and sharpened them and stuff. And then the Canadians would be sent over to England uh, without bayonets, and then they would receive bayonets profiled like this which they didn't change all too much. So if I, if I hold it up again, so as you can see here, the they're exactly the same shape. So I'll put my fingertip on both. So they're the same length, they're the same exact shape. The only difference is that right there. So they took, took that little section of the blade, that rounded section off, and they made it more pointy. And this actually made the bayonet actually very effective, um, but it did add a problem the tips tend to break off on these a lot. So let's say you got your bayonet on, which a lot of times you did during during World War One. You have your bayonet on, and you're running, 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 and you trip, okay? And you bury this thing into the ground, you can snap the tip right off because it's actually a fairly, fairly hardened steel. So the, the blades didn't tend to ba bend, they tended to snap. And it's a lot easier to do with the Ross because the Ross is so incredibly long. Okay, I'm five foot ten inches tall, so like seventy inches tall, and this right, this thing with the bay, the Ross Mark III uh, M1910 with this bayonet on is only a few inches shorter than I am. So the rifle is fifty and a half inches long, and then you know you figure the muzzle comes to the ring here, and you're adding another ten inches. So that's pretty long. That's sixty inches. So a little bit over sixty inches. They take the same sheath, this is the original sheath, which is a nice formed piece of leather, okay? It's held in place with a staple and a nice seam right here along the back. It has a huge rivet to protect the tip there. Um, it is flexible, so it's just leather as you can see. So this sheath is just leather. Down at the bottom here though, so about the last two inches, so from about my fingertip to the end though, there's a little cup down there to protect the point of the blade and then there is a throat up here which basically comes down to about where the belt attachment is on the sheath so so the middle part is flexible but there is a metal throat and a metal tip protector and both of these bayonets fit into the same the same sheath as you can see and no flex because it comes basically right down to the tip so that's cool they didn't need to make a new sheath for the bayonet when they modified it, which is great. And later you'll see a lot of these same exact sheaths cut down when these were made into fighting knives. So both of these models of bayonet were would have the um, the quill in here and the <clears throat> the ring removed and then they would be taken about half their length would be taken off to they have about about a six or seven inch blade. And turned into fighting knives during World War II. And you can see very a lot of photos of those. And they were actually really good knives because once again, I said they hold an edge very, very well. They're made out of very, very good steel. But I just wanted to share some little unknown history about the Ross rifle with you guys and the fact that the bayonet was just as much of a 
mess up as the rifle itself was. So, because Canadians in World War I couldn't seem to catch a break. But hopefully you liked this video and this little kind of unknown story about the Ross rifle and, you know, some stuff like that. Because I wanted to turn out a video here for you guys before I go to work and I'm sorry I haven't been making videos as as frequently as possible. I'm trying, trying to pay some stuff down, obviously, you know, and I'm trying to deal with monetization with YouTube and I'm trying to deal with a whole new schedule and a whole new budget because I have a new job. So I appreciate you guys bearing with me and all that. It means a lot to me. So, but thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.